podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello, I'm Eddie Gibbs and welcome to another episode of Media Matters here on Anfield Index. And uh, you may have guessed with me being on that uh, Dave Davis is away and I expect that the Greek islands have sold out of Cherry Pepsi Max with his presence uh, on those Sunshine Islands. But of course, we are here with our regular reporter on a Monday and it's David Lynch. How are you, David? Yeah, good, good. A uh, few things happening around. So, we, you know, having the press conference last week was nice. So feeling a little bit busier and, and less like we're scratching around for news. So that's good. And yeah, not not too bad. I just need the weather to, to perk up. But obviously that's never going to happen when you're in the UK. So uh, certainly in the northern parts. <laughs> Although I think Wimbledon's been pretty badly affected. I saw the roof was shut for most of the tennis there over the weekend. So it's not just us. <laughs> Yeah, we we should just have a roof over the entire northwest as well. I'd take that. <laughs> nice. I'm sure the Lancashire cricket grounds would appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got we've got a bit to discuss. Uh, now, last week when you were on with Dave, we had announced uh, that you were starting up your Substack. You were going uh, completely freelance, and you were going to be doing your own uh, articles. And I went and signed up to that last Monday, and uh, there's been a few uh, a few pieces uh, on there since. So I'm going to start with a couple of them. But first of all, how, how's it gone? How did the how did the launch go? Yeah, good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, to really good support early doors, which is which is amazing. So thank you to everyone who subscribed. And obviously, if you're listening to this and you you, you enjoy what we talk about every Monday, and you, you think there's there's insights on there that are worthwhile, then yeah, please please do go and get involved. But yeah, it's been a big leap and, and got some really good support. And thank you, thank you to you for subscribing as well. So yeah, no, been been really really happy and and obviously more more to come on there as well in terms of writing and and hopefully more transfers to get into soon as well. Well, there's an offer that I'm sure people can't refuse. And David's being very humble, saying that uh, he thinks there might be stuff that people will, uh, <laughs> will will like to read. Of course, there'll be stuff that people will like to read, and we'll include a link in this bio to David's Substack so that you can uh, you can go along. It's it's only the price of a coffee a month, and you're getting so much content from David there. So it's uh, it's well worth your while. So please uh, please do take the opportunity to give it a go and support David and uh, and his endeavours in this uh, big step that he's taken uh, this summer. So uh, let's start with one of the first pieces that you wrote actually and it was about the olympics it was about endo and it was about sour and the fact that they won't be hooking up with the uh with the uh, egyptian or uh, japanese squads respectively for that tournament so uh how significant is this for liverpool do you feel uh do you think it's going to affect their performances going into the season obviously both players on that other side of 30 now yeah i think i think it's a, bo- a boost for liverpool i think yeah, I-, I think with salah it's an interesting one I-, I never really sort of expected that he would be involved i think he never really got noises from his side of things that he was desperate to be part of it. It was always kind of clearly Egypt would have liked him to go if, if possible, but I didn't think from the player's side, he's played in the Olympics before, didn't think he was going to really push to be involved in this and, and be there at a, what is essentially an under-23 tournament. But I do know, you know, I know, I know for a fact that, that from the Endo side of things that he would have liked to have gone. Um, and so that could have given Liverpool a little bit of a headache. So the fact he's ended up being omitted, and it is an omission rather than sort of him being denied to to go. I, I don't think that that conversation hadn't taken place or anything like that. It was a player would have liked to have gone, but Japan actually have gone down the route of not including any over twenty three players. So uh, they, they've approached it in that way, which is which is kind of interesting. But but yeah, he would have liked to have gone, and I think. You know, you talk about Liverpool's options in in holding midfield, and they're a little bit sparse there. And people maybe want a, a quality option bringing in, and that debate will will rumble on for the rest of the summer, I'm sure. But the idea that they would have been weakened in pre season by not having you know a player who's who, who was important to them last season to to not be there when when slot is you know embedding his tactical framework and his ideas, I think that would have been a real blow. So so the the news that both. Both players will be involved fully in pre-season, I think, is a big boost. And as you allude to, 
age wise as well, putting those minutes in the legs over the summer. I just, you know, particularly when so many others are playing major tournaments as well, I just think it wouldn't have been particularly helpful for Liverpool. So I think it's I think it's good news from a selfish perspective for Liverpool that 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 neither of them is going to be involved in the Olympics. Yeah, that, I mean, it's it's one of those, isn't it? It's like when you see that they're omitted, you feel great and obviously you feel for the players because maybe they would like that opportunity. It sounds like Endo would have liked that opportunity to have done so, but it doesn't sound either like it's been Liverpool at Liverpool's behest either. It's just been a decision that's been made by the Japanese FA or the Japanese Olympic Committee and they've decided that they're going with an under-23 team. So I suppose it, it couldn't have gone better for Liverpool, really, this one. Well, exactly, because I suppose if, you know, if it had come to it and he had been called up Endo then... You know, there's discussions to have there, the player pushing his case to go versus, you know, it, it really is the, the, the club v country route to, to use the cliche. So um, I, I'm guess glad, Liverpool a little bit relieved that they've avoided that. And I think for the player, it's just one of those that, you know, because there are no under 23 players involved, you just got to suck it up and, and move on. And he doesn't get to, to go to a third Olympics. But yeah, he can focus now fully on Liverpool and, and hopefully have a really good and strong pre-season and, and make a case to be involved in that first game of the season and, and going forward under slot. Now, another piece that you did on your sub stack this week is really good. It was about Darwin Nunes uh, and uh, his potential impact under un, under Arna slot. Now, can you elaborate on how critical this could be for Liverpool's season, this, this, this Darwin Nunes sort of paradigm effectively that's going on with uh with slot having said he's spoken to the player with darwin nunes seeming to score freely for uruguay uh do you think we'll get a chance to see this transformation this season or do you think seeing darwin nunes explode at liverpool as everyone keeps alluding to is just a pipe dream well it's hard it's hard to say i mean i'm i'm, I'm skeptical after what we've seen across the last two seasons and i don't think any coach can sort of completely iron out the scruffiness in his finish and i just think that is a characteristic of his. I don't think you're ever going to see him, you know, pulling off the, the classy finishes. He's just never going to be that sort of player. But I think what was interesting, one of the things I spoke about in the piece is, you know, okay, why, why is he different for Uruguay? Why is he scoring more regularly? And, and you know, for, for people who haven't read it, you know, the, the idea you could say, well, international football is a lesser level. And I get that argument. I, I get it's not. The Premier League is probably a, a higher standard in general in terms of the organisation and the quality of the players that you you're coming up against, but but also his scoring record, which was he scored he scored ten goals in seven games up to up to the last game, um, he, he, which is just remarkable, and and it was against a lot of big hitters as well. So you know Argentina, Brazil, you know the big sides who he's coming up against and scoring against. So I think the question was, you know, how how do you make him you know more prolific? How does Uruguay have? What how are you sort of covering up the rough edges in his game? How 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 are Uruguay managing in that? And from looking at the, the, the those those ten goals that he'd scored, the the thing that really came across was that, you know, nine out of the ten were, were first time finishes. And I think that, you know, that it works in terms of you know, we all know that from watching him for the last couple of years, is that he's better when it is a first time finish. He he still misses some of those, don't get me wrong, but I think the more time he has to think about his finish, the less likely or the less confident you are that he's gonna put it away. Um, and so it's all about, OK, how do you get him in positions for first-time finishes? Why are Uruguay managing that? Is it because they're slightly more 4 2 3 one and they have a number 10 who gets closer to him and creates more space for him to just be the last man, you know, rather than the pullback? It, 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 it's an interesting one. And, uh, you know, it, sometimes those things can be, yes, they can be part of your tactics, but they can also just be pure fluke that that keeps happening for Uruguay. And he's on a little run of that happening. Um, and I suppose the big question is for Arna Slot is, you know, is there a tactical solution to that? Can you make it so that he's more the first time finisher rather than sort of having having time to to run onto the ball? I, you know, I, I don't I don't know if that's something the manager can solve, but you you have to hope he can because you know no, you know, my, very much my understanding that that he is one of the players that was a big focus for Liverpool in terms of when what they were looking for in a new manager is someone who can develop attacking talent. Um, and can maybe get the best out of an expensive uh, investment like Nunez. Now, you know, I'd also argue that Klopp has has been renowned as a play as a manager who gets the best out of young attackers, and he never quite cracked it with Nunez. So this, I think, this is one of the big tests for Slot. And I think if if Nunez doesn't put it all together in a in a satisfactory way this season, you know, there's a real argument that he could end up being sold. Um, in in the summer that follows. I think this is kind of a bit of a do or die season for him. Um, but like I say, very hard to predict whether that is possible or whether 
a tweak in tactics or a slight change in setup will will get the best out of him. But it's something Liverpool have to hope for because I just don't think you can carry a player whose whose goal scoring numbers aren't you know or as they are, particularly when he doesn't quite bring that Firmino level of class uh, to to sort of substitute for goal scoring numbers. He does need to be a goal scorer. So it's a yeah really interesting plot point I think going into into next season is what what can slot get out of him. Yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. He's obviously going to be one of the guys that arrives back very late. For uh, but he may miss entirely the uh, Liverpool preseason tour of the US. The deeper Uruguay, obviously, go into that competition. It's something that Liverpool now with the Euros and with the Copa America are affected by a few players. So from looking like very few are going to be involved in the latter stages of these tournaments, it does look like a few are going to be. So that is going to affect Liverpool's plans now. I was doing the rounds on social media yesterday when I had a half an hour to kill, and there was some buzz around Bobby Clark and uh, a possible new contract but there was also talk about clubs inquiring about his availability for loan this season at the same time quite a few clubs actually and uh, I just wanted to know if you had any updates on that front yeah so I, I, I must admit not not heard personally anything on this but I will the one thing I will say is that you know given his age profile um, and, and what he did last season it would be very much in keeping with Liverpool's strategy in recent years to give him a new contract and possibly send him on loan I think that we've seen that combination an awful lot you know, he made big strides last season, but the big question Liverpool have got, you know, I'm sure it will impress in pre-season and the manager see there's real quality there and he did take big steps forward last season. But I think the question is, is there going to be enough minutes around for him next season to to keep progressing? And I would argue that, you know, he, he kind of got fortunate really in terms of the injuries last season, giving him opportunities. I think if there hadn't been quite as many injuries, he wouldn't have played as much football and it wouldn't have been a good se- as good a season for, for him on a personal level. So, you know, I'd be very much thinking that the, the player's perspective, I think, alone will, would really be best. And no doubt Liverpool are, are fielding inquiries from, from all sorts of clubs because that tends to happen whether you plan is to loan or not. You know, clubs will chance to hand and, and see what's out there. So, you know, I, I think that, the you know, very likely outcome for him this, this summer is a new contract and, and a loan move. But in terms of, you know, I think Liverpool will will maybe wait a little bit because I don't think the decision's been made around him being loaned yet. You know, he's one of that group of young players who the loan offers are coming in, but a decision will be made later in pre-season because, you know, they need players around now for starters. And then, and as I say, in terms of decision and, and injuries and where the squad is looking up to later in the summer, that is when they'll make a decision on sending him out. But but from from my perspective, I think that would be the best route to go down because I want him to see him build on what he did last season with more regular football at a a decent level which I think he would get in terms of loan offers yeah let's uh let's hope something materializes there because no matter whether it be a Liverpool or elsewhere it'd be really good to see that kid getting a a bit more football uh to build upon what he did last year because he's really good when he came in and you just want to see if he can kind of work out at that level or not and the only way to tell is by playing football and doesn't matter how much training you do you're never going to know otherwise now during the scour of social media that I did last night I also saw uh Adrian had obviously posted a video saying farewell to Liverpool. Now, this was expected, though you spoke about this with Dave on the on the show in the past. But then James Pierce, one of your former colleagues, he reported that uh, Vitislav Yaros will step up to the first team squad. And it's been rumoured all summer, obviously, that Kevin Kelleher will move on or may move on. So how do you see this reshuffling affecting the goalkeeping situation at the club? Yeah, it's an interesting one with, with Yaros and obviously the, the club very much saying that he, he is going to be the, the third choice going into next season. I, I suppose the big question around that is, is Yaros happy with that? Obviously, he's had a few low moves now. I mean, he, he's still young, so, you know, it's not kind of a, a huge blow to to go into a, a, a season where he's going to be third choice. But you, you would like to see him get minutes as well if he's going to be around for that role, obviously. Adrian, in recent years, he, he was the third choice and, and just didn't play at all, so... You know, for Yaros, especially with the low move that he had last season, the back end of last season was really, really productive for him. So, as I say, the, the main question is whether he he is kind of happy with that role. But I think if he is, and he and he goes into the season, and they say even his third choice, you may be going to get League Cup minutes. That would that could be really, really good for him. Hopefully, there's some sort of agreement there around that, and 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 I, and I think that that will be very much the the pecking order until something kind of changes. I think you know, with with Kelleher, it's. You know, we're all kind of selling him in our minds, but that that offer has got to come in, and the money has got to be right. You know, we're, we're too, you know, it's too easy for us sometimes to say, okay, Liverpool would be open to selling him at this amount. We all think, well, that's a done deal then. But you know, the, the club's got to come in for him, and and the contract's got to be right. The deal with Liverpool's got to be right. So, 
you know, Yarosh is, is, is third choice at the moment, but it's that is a, a, a movable feast, really, isn't it? We we will have to see what happens with Keller and then how Liverpool attack that in terms of do they promote Yarosh to second choice and then you know buy maybe a an older third choice goalkeeper. That's you know that that's all you know up in the air at the moment. But I, I'd say I totally understand Liverpool's perspective that for right now Yarosh is is very much third choice. But there is, of course, you know. There's going to be some movement. Is all uh, you know? Maybe we expect, and it is likely that there will be some movement in that goalkeeping department. But until it happens, you can't you can't sort of make any predictions or say that anything is is nailed off. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. Ha. This is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super-fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, via TV, PC, Mac and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, Mac boxes and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. And you've nothing new on the Kelleher side of things just now. I take it that's quiet just now. Yeah, really quiet. Um, Again, I I expect there to be interest because I think he just had a great season last season. He's been great for Liverpool whenever he's come in. And and I think that, you know, I know for a fact there was some reluctance from clubs last summer to, to maybe make the move because they felt he had, you know, didn't have quite enough first team experience. Even though he'd he'd won a League Cup final and he played those competitions, he went for players who had a little bit more first team experience. But I think you know you look at what he did for Liverpool last season and and kept them in things when when you know when Allison was out injured. I think a lot of those concerns will have been sort of abated now for clubs and I, I think he's very much now seen as a top class option to come in and be a first team goalkeeper somewhere. But we just got to wait for those offers to come in, and and you know we, we, we'll, we'll we'll see when that happens. Maybe that you know he's back for pre season now. He's not involved in a major tournament, so maybe we start to see some movement on that pretty soon. But nothing, nothing yet in sort of in terms of concrete interest or or anything Liverpool are, are fielding on that. Now the third of the things I noticed on social media last night when I was doing the scour ahead of the show was the reports that Thiago Alcantara is set to retire from football at the age of 33, quite young obviously for a retirement, but that's after his release from Liverpool. Uh, what are your thoughts on Thiago's career and of course his time with Liverpool this past few years? Yeah, it's sad, sad really that, that he's he's retired at such a young age, but he's, he's said for a long time, hasn't he, that his, his hip is, is in bits really and, and, and I think, you know, Rather than sort of go down a level or whatever, he can he can call it a day at Liverpool. Not make that chronic hip injury any worse, and and sort of go and enjoy his life, and 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 so glad to see it from that perspective. But it just seems sad because it's you know loss of an unbelievable footballing talent, and I think you know I think his Liverpool career kind of sums up his career in general. Is is breathtaking class whenever he got on the pitch, unbelievable footballer, one of the best passes of the ball that you'd ever see, and and the ability to manipulate the ball just remarkable but you know we didn't see it often enough did we and I think you know you look at that that season when Liverpool went very close to the quadruple um, you know he was a massive massive part of that and I think his Liverpool career would have been maybe viewed differently as well if Liverpool had got one of the big ones in that season either the Champions League or the Premier League Um, but as it is you know just leaves with the FA Cup and, and two League Cups and you just think that and, and barely having played in his, his final season you, you know there's just that little bit of regret there but no, no doubts whatsoever about his class as a footballer, but there was always that question mark about his body, and, and in the end, that kind of, as I say, summed up his Liverpool career, his career in general. Um, but what a joy to watch if we if we're to focus on the positives, and 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 glad that we did get to see him in a Liverpool shirt at times because it was yeah unbelievable when he when he could play. 
Yeah, such a shame. Uh, absolutely delightful player. Absolutely sublime on his day. And uh, I'll always remember back to that game. It, was, it wasn't the 7-1. It was the season before the Man United game at Anfield. And it, I mean, it was an absolute masterclass that night. He just absolutely bossed that field. And there were, it was like, this is my playground and you're all, you're all invited to watch. <laughs> yeah, he, he did. He, that, that, I think that was probably his best performance in Liverpool shirt. Just absolutely the dominant force in that game. And um, yeah, I, I think that that's how you want to remember him rather than the fact that, you know, I mean, last season was just a disaster, wasn't it? But it's, um, yeah, it, it's just such a shame, isn't it? When you get a player like that who's got such such quality but just can't get on the pitch regularly enough. But maybe you just got to enjoy the moments they did get on the pitch. And, and there were there were so many of those and so many moments of class. And, uh, you know, that Porto goal is another moment that lives in the memory. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, just that that for me kind of sums him up in terms of, a, a, just a genuine level of quality that you even at the top top uh, uh, you know echelons of the game ha, have you ever seen someone strike a ball like that I still maintain it doesn't even touch the grass it, it, it just you know the the air and the swazzing puts on it it's just yeah incredible what a footballer and, and a joy to watch yeah gravity defying stuff that one for sure I don't think anyone will have the answer to how that ball was struck that sweetly and ended up where it did <laughs> okay so let's move on you alluded to this at the top of the show and it was uh Anna Slot's first press conference. Now, you were there. I heard you asking a question. And uh, I wanted to know what your first impressions were, first of all, of the man, the aura, the, 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 the sort of presence in the room. What, 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 how, did he hold, how did he hold court? Yeah, I, th- I think the, 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 obviously the cliche is to, to say, oh, well, I thought he spoke well. And, but, but I, you know, I did think there were some encouraging moments in there, nice, nice moments. I think, I, I think what I would say is that I thought he was slightly more measured than I've seen him in press conferences before. I mean, you, you remember seeing the, the, the latter part of his Feyenoord career when he was, you know, he's fielding questions left, right and centre about Liverpool, wasn't he? And he, he seemed very, you know, confident and at ease in those press conferences. I think he was a little bit more sort of paired back in these ones. But I think, you know, there'll be several reasons for that. I think obviously the first is that he doesn't know the journalist there. It's, it's an uncomfortable situation. It's a big step for him. You know, I'm not saying nervous, by the way, but just just slightly less at ease. But, you know, a big moment for him, you know, stepping up to that club. And I think obviously that will come with time as well is the familiarity with the journalists. I'm, I'm sure there'll be slightly less uh, or slightly fewer journalists at the next press conference as well. And it's just previewing a game at Ipswich. So there's that to factor in as well in... in but I thought, you know, he, he did still even even saying that. I thought, you know, there was steeliness in the right moment. So, you know, for example, he clearly has very strong opinions about where Trent's going to play, um, and the same with Gakpo. And that's obviously a topic uh, of huge debate, isn't it? And um, and and that that question when he was asked about the formation, which again I thought was a fair question, by the way, because you know I know for a fact that Dave and I have talked about four two three one quite a lot on this podcast because. You know, I've read so many tactic, tactics writers who told me that's that's what they play, and obviously, Slot doesn't agree with that at all. So I thought that was you know he showed a real sort of edge to him in sort of answering that, and and he obviously joked about it, didn't he? But again, showed strong opinions that he, he you know he knows his own mind and he knows what his, his his tactical setup is, and he doesn't want anyone confusing that. So yeah, so I I, I, I like those moments, and he came off as as humble, which again, what yeah, absolutely that's what you want from a Liverpool manager. They can't be up themselves, can they? And and answered everything that was just thrown at him, and I thought you did you did well with the clock questions as well because he got peppered with quite a lot about clock, which is you know it's to be you can understand that because he was such an iconic figure for Liverpool. Um, but obviously he, he didn't shy away from them in, in in any sense, but he just answered them calmly. And I thought the best example of that was the start when you know, he gets thrown that normal one quote at him, doesn't he? And that's a day it's tricky because Klopp immediately ingratiated himself to the English media by by throwing that line in. But Slot didn't, he didn't try and one-up it. He didn't try and beat it in any way, did he? He just kind of, he took it and said, look, you know, as long as I'm, you know, I, I do a good enough job here, then I'll, I'll be remembered as nicely as Jürgen was. And that, that is absolutely the key, isn't it? There's nothing more to say than that, really. It doesn't. It, he's right, and it doesn't really matter what he says in the press conferences. As long as his teams are good and the, and people like him, then you know that's the only thing that matters. So he, he got to the heart of that and and, and dealt with the Klopp stuff well. So yeah, I thought as as, as impressive as you can be at unveiling, Raw was probably going to be generous to him anyway. But I thought, yeah, I, I I thought he did as well as you can ask, really, and some some good answers in there. 
Yeah, I noticed on uh, social media again that you reached out to Chris Pajak, who uh, who asked that question about the formation. Chris, our friend from the Redmen TV, of course, and uh, I did as well in private. I, I spoke to Chris uh, on on Friday as well in the afternoon just to kind of make sure he was all right more than anything because he, he did get he did get a bit of a body slam there, and it, it, it did surprise me as well. I was a bit shocked by by. by yeah, that. I- I think Slot was smiling. He wasn't, you know, trying to... I don't think he was trying to kill Chris by any means, but he was more saying, you know, who's kind of told you that? And, and he's right too, like I say, because, you know, I've read so many people telling me that it's a 4-2-3-1 and maybe I should be more of a tactical myself and, and watch more games and analyse a little bit more. But in, yeah, it's, it's it's interesting, isn't it, that he, he to- totally rejected that because I, I really had made that assumption and, and so... Yeah, I thought it was a, a really interesting answer that you gave there about that that being different. And I'm very much now kind of looking forward to seeing it with my own eyes and seeing what this setup yeah. looks like. And Chris, uh, Chris said to me actually that he uh, he wanted to ask a football question. That was the most important thing you were mentioning the Klopp questions. Chris didn't want to ask anything like that, or he, he actually wanted to ask a football question, and he did that, and he probably got the best answer, uh, yeah. even though it was. Uh, uh, on the thing, and it's cro- that's why we're talking about it now. It's obviously the point that that you remember, that I remember, that, that, that uh, from that press conference. So, uh, so fair play to Chris on that. Now, you mentioned the club stuff, and I can understand that. I can understand anyone coming from a press room with an editor with sub editors. They want that light, you know what I mean? So you don't have that issue. Chris doesn't have that issue, but other people that were at that press conference do. So I can totally understand why why they wanted that line. And they, if they'd gone back without tr- at least trying to get it, <laughs> then they'd have their knuckles wrapped. So I can I can totally understand why they did that. Yeah, exactly. And, you, and you've also got to try and tee him up to, to, to come up with something as memorable as a, the normal one, quote, unfortunately. He, he didn't give in and give that one. But but I, yeah, like you say, I, I to- totally get why he was asked about that. And, and Klopp is such an iconic figure. So, you you, you know, you are going to you know start to make those comparisons that he's unveiling that and that has to happen. But it's, uh, yeah, and I thought he dealt with that really, really well because, you know, it, and I think in, in everything I've seen this week, actually, in, in the training stuff, he's not trying to be... Jurgen, he's not, you know, he's, he's yeah. just being his own man and, and and getting on with the work, and and that's great. That's what Liverpool need. They they, they don't need a, a, a sort of a, a worse version of someone doing an impression of Klopp. They they need someone who's going to come in and and has the, a strong mind and is, is strong willed and able to to deal with the job. And you know, we we, we don't know yet exactly how that's going to play out, but I think the the early signs are at least decent, and and you can go from there. Now the other thing that struck me from the press conference, and I'm sure sure you as well, whether you probably had some notice of it, was that uh, Richard Hughes was there with Arna Slot for this press conference, and that is a massive sea change from the previous Michael Edwards, Jurgen Klopp era. What did you make of that? That that Richard was in it. He spoke very well, I thought as well. Yeah, kind of surprised, for, as you say, because we've never seen that with Michael Edwards. Never got to ask Julian Ward a question. Same with Jorg Schmack. So you know, a real, real change to do that. And you know, I, I think it sort of says a lot about how the sporting structure has changed as well. I mean, you think back to Jürgen being unveiled and Tom Werner was there. He, he spoke and, and Ian Eyre was there and he was the CEO at the time. Um, and obviously things have kind of changed now. They want a slightly more, I mean, I wouldn't say public facing with, with, with Richard Hughes because I don't think he's going to make a regular habit of this or, or very much my understanding. He's not going to be in, in press conferences week to week or, or making himself available for interviews frequently because... You know, I think he hopes there's no need for that, to be honest. Um, but but I think it does show that that Liverpool are going to be structured in this way is a it is that kind of more continental style where you know he's slightly more available than you've you've seen in the past and 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 very much that you know having someone speak on these matters who isn't who isn't the CEO who isn't just attached to the financial elements of the club. It's someone who's actually got the sporting background and. And as you say again, you know he seemed very comfortable. Did you know? Didn't seem phased by it. You know he answered the questions as well as you can hope. Obviously, you know the contract form was a good example of you know can only say so much. Can he? He, he can't. Those are private negotiations that he got to keep uh, his cards close to his to, to his chest on. But obviously, he you know he, he answered as best he could. And and I thought there was some openness there as well about the transfer stuff, which which you maybe wouldn't have expected. So. Um, yeah, it was it was decent. It was good good to good to see him do that, and and good to to get to know him a little bit more. And and Liverpool didn't have to do that. I was as I said, wasn't expecting it at all. So that was kind of a yeah a nice little bonus to give us a little bit more insight into what you know what these new figures who are in charge are like, and and what we can expect going forward. So that was that was really welcome. I thought yeah. 
Yeah, on the transfers specifically, you mentioned that uh, expected transfer activity to be quiet until August with a possible crescendo uh, after these tournaments of uh, the, the, the Euros and the Copper America are finished. Uh, so do you foresee minimal tra- transfer activity until then, certainly on Liverpool's side, or, or do you think this is a bit of PR talk from the new sporting director? Yeah, I, I guess it's one of those where you kind of, you should probably never take them on face value. But I, I also kind of believe them. I think, you know, it's not just the Euros on, is it? It's the Copper America as well. So that, you know, the, the, the both tournaments and the Olympics as well. So even any of you those know, under 23 players, and there's some, you know, really, there are some class players who are, are going to be involved in the Olympics who would definitely be on the radar of a club like Liverpool. So, you know, I think he's right to say that, that he doesn't think that, that there's going to be too much action. And and it works both ways. It's not just for Liverpool. It's also, you know, in terms of selling as well as, as buying, it, it's it's going to be it's going to be an issue for them in the summer and, and something they have to think about. So, you know, like I say, you can't always take them on face value, but I did actually kind of believe that. And I, and I admired the honesty as well. And maybe it'll prove helpful in terms of, I know people, some people are already getting a little bit antsy about, you know, uh, what are Liverpool doing? But you, you look at the, the wider game and, he, and Richard Hughes made this point. It's not just Liverpool, it's kind of quiet at the moment. So clearly the the, the tournaments are having a knock-on effect on the, 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 the summer window. So... Um, I, I did kind of believe him on that, and I, and I do think it's going to be quiet with a with a with a flurry towards the end of the window, which you know Liverpool seemingly are planning for that. They're ready for that to to, to react in that way. So, um, you know, if they're ready for it, then that that bodes well, and and and, and you know they, they clearly got plans. The final thing from the press conference I wanted to ask you about was uh, other slot almost seemed to let a cat out the bag in terms of these uh, new personnel that may be joining his backroom staff. And I think it was Tony quickly uh, quickly rebuked him on that to make sure that nothing came out. Uh, do you have any insight on who these people might be or what their roles might be? I, unfortunately not. I very much wish uh, I wish that I did because I, I would absolutely be writing that right now. But I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing digging out, I can promise you that. But um, I, I, I think one... You know, it's clear that at least one more coach is going to come out. I very much knew that because obviously he did want to bring Yeti and Ryan with him, um, and obviously that it, it, you know got Kai Bosch due to to work permit issues, and I don't think there's any solution incoming for that. So um, clearly, he sort of needs someone else who's going to fulfil that kind of coach slash analyst role. So that's something they're very much looking for, uh, and obviously a set piece coach is, is something we know they advertise for as well. So another coach there. So I, I guess possibly those are going to be the two roles: is that coach slash analyst and a set piece coach. So that that's something they're looking for at the moment. But it, it sounds like they're not too far away from making those appointments. From what he said, I mean, they clearly could have said the names. I think uh, uh, you know maybe there's something to be cleared there in terms of contracts and signing those off. But it seems like they've already got who they've got. Um, it's just a case of of finding out who those are, and those announcements are going to come soon. So, hey guys, it's Eddie Gibbs from Anfield Index here. I hope you're enjoying this podcast and I'm sorry to call time on the show before it ends. In the current climate, it's tougher than ever before to offer podcasts for free. At Anfield Index, we produce over 75 free shows every month, which I'm confident is unparalleled in the LFC sphere. Whilst we'd love to offer everything for free, the production costs now make this impossible. That said, we don't want to follow the model of other channels and lock all of our content behind a paywall. So what we've decided to do is to continue offering every show for free, but cut that offering to 30 minutes on our longer shows. So to get all of our shows in full and enjoy the best of everything we have to offer, we really hope you'll consider supporting the channel and signing up at AnfieldIndexPro.com. For about the price of one cup of coffee, you'll get every podcast in full with zero ads. You'll also get access to our LFC VIP community where you can enjoy live podcasts, engage with our podcasters, and chat with other Reds in real time. So that website again, anfieldindexpro.com. Join today. Sports Social Podcast Network.